Okay, everyone, it's time to talk a little women in history, and let's talk about women's rights because we've come a really long way. Seeing as today, let me see if I can make this work. I've spent my day folding laundry. I am very domestic and doing all my domestic chores. So hopefully you put your laundry away, children. Do what your parents say. And let's talk about how successful women were at gaining rights during the French Revolution. Or did they? I don't know. They didn't. Let's be honest. Have a good day. Enjoy the so women participated in virtually every aspect of the French Revolution, but their participation almost always proved controversial. In fact, prior to the French Revolution, in the 18th century, those who favored improving the status of women insisted prim primarily on women's rights to an education, rather than on the right to vote, for instance, which few men at this time even enjoyed. The writers during the Enlightenment most often took a very traditional stance on the woman question. They viewed women as biologically and therefore socially different from men, um, destined to play a domestic role inside the family rather than a public or political role. Among the many writers of the Enlightenment, Jean Jacques Rousseau published the most influential works on the subject of women's role in society. In his book, Amalie, he described his vision of an ideal education for women. Women should take an active role in the family, Rousseau insisted, by breastfeeding and educating their children, but they should not venture to take active positions outside the home. Rousseau's writings on education electrified his audience, both male and female. He advocated greater independence and autonomy for male children and emphasized the importance of mothers in bringing up children. But many women objected to the insistence that women did not need serious intellectual preparation for life. Some women took their pleas for education into the press. Before 1789, such ideas fell on deaf ears. The issue of women's rights, unlike the rights of Protestants, Jews, and blacks, did not lead to essay contests, official commissions, or Enlightenment-inspired clubs under the monarchy. In part, this lack of interest followed from the fact that women were not considered a persecuted group like Calvinist Jews are slaves. And there's some just visuals here that kind of show you during this time period that the issue of slavery was very, um, was out in the forefront and there were lots of um, Jewish Enlightenment thinkers such as Mendelssohn um, who were advocating for religious tolerance but um, you don't see much in the way of tolerance or increased rights for women. Although women's property rights and financial independence met with many restrictions under French law and custom, most men and women agreed with Rousseau and other Enlightenment thinkers that women belonged in the private sphere of the home and therefore had no role in public affairs. Most of France's female population worked as peasants, shopkeepers, laundresses, and the like. Yet women were defined primarily by their sex and relationship in marriage and not by their own occupations. So I just had to put a Jane Austen quote up here. It's a little adapted for modern times, but it says, Hey girl, I love that you've improved your mind through extensive reading. Coffee houses are shown on the left-hand side here, and you can see that there are no women except for the lady behind the counter. It's all men in the public sphere. Women were allowed to be educated, but were to be educated in areas that were related to the private sphere. The question of women's, women's rights thus trailed behind in the agitation for human rights in the 18th century. But like all other questions of rights, it would get an enormous boost during the revolution when Louis XVI agreed to convene a meeting of the Estates General for May of 1789 to discuss the financial problems of the country. He unleashed a torrent of public discussion. The Estates General had not met since 1614, and its meeting heightened everyone's expectation for reform. The king invited the three estates, the clergy, the nobility, and the third estate, who was made up of everyone who was not a noble or a cleric, to elect deputies through an elaborate, multi-layered electoral process and to draw up lists of their grievances, or cayers, is what they were called to do. At every stage of the electoral process, participants, mainly men, but with a few females here and there at a parish level meetings, devoted considerable time and political negotiation to the composition of these lists of grievances. Since the king had not invited women to meet as women to draft their grievances or name delegates, a few took matters into their own hands and sent him petitions outlining their concerns. The modesty of 
most of these complaints and demands demonstrates the deep um, seated prejudice against women's separate political activity. See, they didn't ask for very much, which tells you that they didn't even expect these women very much for themselves. Women could ask for better education and protection of their property rights, but even the most politically outspoken among them did not demand full civil and political rights. In fact, when you finish this video, you will read and summarize the Cayer attributed to a woman located on the webpage, and you'll get an idea of what women were complaining about during this time and to what extent they wanted change. After the fall of the Bastille on the 14th of July in 1789, politics became the order of the day. The attack on the Bastille showed how popular political intervention could change the course of events. When the people of Paris rose up, armed themselves, and assaulted the royal fortress prison in the center of Paris, they changed any royal or aristocratic aristocratic plans to stop the revolution in its tracks by arresting the deputies or closing the new National Assembly. In October of 1789, the revolution seemed to hang in the balance again. In the midst of a continuing shortage of bread, rumors circulated that the royal guards at Versailles, um, the palace where the king and his family resided, had trampled on the revolutionary colors, which were red, white, and blue and plotted counter-revolution. In response, a crowd of women in Paris gathered to march to Versailles to demand an accounting from the king. They trudged the 12 miles from Paris in the rain, arriving soaked and tired. At the end of the day and during the night, the women were joined by thousands of men who had marched from Paris to join them. The next day, the crowd grew more turbulent and even broke into the royal apartments, killing two of the king's bodyguards. To prevent further bloodshed, the king agreed to move his family back to Paris. So you can see these are some of the revolutionary um, women and men com com commemorating their October Revolution where they went and got um, the king and queen to come back, from Par back to Paris from Versailles. Women's participation was not confined to rioting and demonstrating. Women began to attend meetings of public clubs and both men and women soon agitated for the guarantee of women's rights. In July 1790, a leading intellectual and aristocrat, Marquis de Concordet, published a newspaper article in support of full political rights for women. It caused a sensation. In it, he argued that France's millions of women should enjoy equal political rights with men. A small band of proponents of women's rights soon took shape in the circles around Condorcet. They, they met in a group called the Social Circle, or the Cirque Social which launched a campaign for women's rights in 1790 to 1791. One of their most active members in the area of women's rights was a Dutch woman by the name of Adelaers, who denounced the prejudices against women that denied them equal rights in marriage and education. In their newspapers and pamphlets, the social circle, whose members later became ardent Republicans, argued for a liberal divorce law and reforms in the inheritance law as well. Their associated public clubs set up a female section in March 1791 to work specifically on women's issues, including civil equality in the areas of divorce and property. The boldest of the women's political rights came from the pen of Olympe de Gouges, who was an inspire, aspiring playwright. She bitterly attacked slavery and in September of 1791 published the Declaration of the Rights of Women. Modeled on the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen, she showed how women had been excluded from its promises. Although her declaration did not have widespread support, it did make her notorious. And like many of the other leading female activists, she eventually suffered persecution at the hands of the government and went to the guillotine in 1793. Political, public political activism would come at a high price for women during this time period. Women actually never gained full political rights during the French Revolution. None of the National Assemblies ever considered legislation granting political rights to women. They could neither vote nor hold office. Most deputies thought the very idea outlandish. This did not stop women from continuing to participate in unfolding events. Their participation took various forms. Some demonstrated or even rioted over price of food. Some joined clubs organized by women, and others took part in movements against the revolution, ranging from individual acts of assassination to joining a massive rebellion in the west of France against the revolutionary government. 
The most dramatic individual act of resistance to the revolution was the assassination of the deputy Jean-Paul Marat by Charlotte Corday on July 13, 1793. Marat had published a newspaper, The Friend of the People, that violently denounced anyone who opposed the direction of the revolution. He called for the heads of aristocrats, hoarders, unsuccessful generals, and even moderate republicans, such as, such as Condorcet, who supported the revolution but resisted its tendency towards violence and intimidation. Corday gained entrance to Marat's dwellings and stabbed him in a back. And the painting you see here was a revolutionary painting by Jean, Le, Jean David. Um, and he did this to support Marat. And he makes him seem like he's almost like a Christ-like figure in the way that he is laid out here with his headstone that says Marat. Um, and then in the next painting, you can see this one is actually titled Charlotte Corday and was painted later to show her as a a great figure who gave up a lot for uh, to stop this revolution that was so tragic and you can see that there seems to have been a struggle and she looks very um, almost angelic like so two different perspectives on the same event but most women acted in more collective less individually striking fashion first and foremost they endeavored to guarantee food for their families Concern over the price of food led to riots in February of 1792 and again in February of 1793. In these disturbances, which often began at the door of shops, women usually played a prominent role. It egging on their confederates to demand lower prices and to insist on confiscating goods and selling them at a, quote, just price. A small but vocal minority of women activists set up their own public political clubs. The best known of these was the Society of Revolutionary Republican Women, established in Paris in May of 1793. The members hoped to gain political education for themselves and a platform for expressing their views to the political authorities. The society did not endorse full political rights for women. It devoted its energies to advocating more stringent me measures against hoarders and counter-revolutionaries and to pr proposing ways for women to participate in the war effort. Accounts of the meetings demonstrate the keen interest of women in political affairs, even when those accounts come from the frankly hostile critics of the women's activities. Male revolutionaries promptly rejected every call for equal rights for women, but their reactions in print and in speech show that these demands troubled their conception of the proper role of women. Now they had to explain themselves. Rejection of women's rights was no longer automatic, in part because of the revolutionary government's established divorce, with equal rights for women and men in suing for divorce and granting girls equal rights to inheritance of family property. As the political situation grew more turbulent and dangerous in the fall of 1793, the revolutionary government became suspicious of the Society of Revolutionary Republican Women. The society had aligned itself with critics of the government who complained about the shortage of food. It also tried to intervene in the individual cases of arrest and imprisonment. But the club did not readily give in to its opponents. One of its leaders, Lacombe, published a pamphlet defending the club. Despite attempts to respond to the charges of its critics, the club ultimately fell victim to the disapproval and suspicion of the revolutionary government, which outlawed all women's clubs, clubs on the 30th of October, 1793. The immediate excuse was a series of altercations between women's clubs mem members and market women over the proper revolutionary costume. But behind the decision lay much discomfort with the idea of women's active political involve, involvement. On the 3rd of November in 1793, Olympia de Gouge, author of the Declaration of the Rights of Woman, was put to death as a counter-revolutionary, condemned for having published a pamphlet suggesting that a popular referendum should decide the future government of the country, not the National Convention. Two weeks later, a city official denounced all political activity by women, warning them that they could be guillotined. The queen was executed on the 16th of October, 1793, after a short but dramatic trial before the Revolutionary Tribunal. Other leading political figures of, from 1792 to 1793, such as the wife of a, a minister and hostess of one of Paris's most influential salons, went to her death, even though she was a convinced Republican. This lady, whose last name was Roland, her crime was that she supported the Girardins, 
the faction of the Constitutionalist deputies that included Condorcet. After the suppression of women's clubs, ordinary women still had to make their way in a difficult political and economic climate. The terror did not spare them, even though it was supposed to be directed against the enemies of the revolution. Many ordinary women went to prison as suspects for complaining about food shortages while waiting in lines at shops, for making disrespectful remarks about the authorities, or for challenging local officials. After the fall of Robespierre in July of 1794, the National Convention eliminated price controls and inflation, and speculation soon resulted in long bread lines once again. The police gathered information every day about the state of discontent, and they worried in particular about the increasing shortages of bread. Between February and March of 1795, women egged men on to attack local and national authorities. These disturbances came to a head in the last major popular insurrections of the revolution when bread rations dropped from one and a half pounds per person in March to one eighth of a pound in April to May of 1795, where rioting then broke out. Women participated in the action by urging men to join demonstrations to demand bread and changes in the national government. On the 20th of May, a large crowd of men and women, armed with guns, pikes, and swords, rushed into the meeting place of the National Convention and chased the deputies from their benches. They killed one and cut off his head. As soon as the government gained control of the situation, it arrested many rioters, prohibited women from entering the galleries of its meeting place and from attending any kind of public as political assembly, or even gathering in groups of more than five in the street, just like the rules at Parkway Plaza Mall for teenagers. Even as the fortunes of women's political activism were rising and falling, women began playing another kind of role as symbols of the revolutionary values. Most of the major revolutionary values, values liberty, equality, fraternity, reason, the republic, regeneration, were represented by female figures, usually in Roman dress or togas. The use of female figures from antiquity followed from the standard iconograph practice. Artists had long used symbols or icons derived from classical Roman or Greek sources as a kind of textbook of artistic representation. French, like the Latin, divided nouns by gender. Most qualities such as liberty, equality, and reason were taken to be feminine. La liberté, l'égalité, la, la raison. So they seemed to require a feminine representation to make them concrete. This led to one of the great paradoxes of the French Revolution. Though the male revolutionaries refused to grant women equal political rights, they put pictures of women on everything, from coins and bills and letterheads to even swords and playing cards. Women might appear in real-life stories of heroism, but they were much more likely to appear as symbols of something else. Although women had not gained the right to vote or hold office, and indeed would not do so in France until 1944, yes, that's after World War II, they had certainly made their presence known during the revolution. At the end of the decade of the revolution, a well-known writer, by Blet, offered her views on its impact on women. Although she stopped short of repeating Condorcet's or Olympia de Gouges' demands for absolute equality for women, she did insist that the revolution had forced women to become more aware of their status in society. She also argued that the Republic should justify itself by offering women more education and more opportunities. Her writing shows that women's demands had been heard and that even if they had gone underground, they had not been forgotten. You guys, just make sure you go back and look at that Cahier that's on the French Revolution webpage that was written by a woman to give it a sense of what women were looking for um, as far as rights and privileges during the French Revolution. Thank you very much. I will see you later. Oh, remember to take good notes and to write three questions that are debatable regarding women. I know you can do it.